Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today, a first on the AAMFT podcast, we've had multiple husband-wife teams in our last three years, but today, a father-daughter duo. And when you think of the field of sex addiction and recovery, you think of only one last name, and that is Carnes. I am so happy to be joined on the podcast by Drs. Patrick and Stephanie Carnes. Patrick Carnes is a nationally known speaker on sex addiction and recovery issues. He's the author of the ground breaking Out of the Shadows, Understanding Sexual Addiction, Contrary to Love, Helping the Sex Addict, and The Betrayal Bond, Breaking Free of Exploitative Relationships. Patrick is the primary architect of the Gratitude Program for the Treatment of Sexual and Addictive Disorders at Pine Grove Behavioral Health and Addiction Services in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He also pioneered the founding of of the Certified Sex Addiction Therapist Program. This has evolved into a network of local, regional, and residential programs which specialize in his life's work. From 1996 to 2004, Pat was a clinical director for sexual disorder services at the Meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona. While there, he developed a therapeutic technology based on his landmark study about the recoveries of over 1,000 sex addicts that he'll talk about today. This work is summarized in his book, Don't Call It Love, which has been described as one of the best books on the market about addiction and its cost and consequences. Dr. Carnes graduated in 1966 from St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, which a Bachelor's of Arts degree. He received his master's degree in 1969 from Brown University and a PhD in counselor education and organizational development from the University of Minnesota in 1980. Patrick was awarded the Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award for the Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health, that's S-A-S-H, and each year, this association bestows a Carnes Award, named after Patrick, to deserving researchers and clinicians who have made outstanding contributions to the field of sexual medicine. Not to be outdone by her father, Dr. Stephanie Carnes, is the president of the International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals, known as ITAP, a training institute and professional organization for addiction professionals. She is the clinical architect for Willow House at the Meadows, where she works with sexually addicted clients and their families, helping those struggle with sex, love, and intimacy disorders. She's an LMFT and an AMFT approved supervisor. Her areas of expertise, working with patients and families dealing with multiple co-occurring addictions, not just sexual addictions, also eating disorders, chemical dependency, and intimacy issues. She's the author of numerous publications, including the books Mending a Shattered Heart, A Guide for Partners of Sex Addicts, and Facing Heartbreak, Steps to Recovery for Partners of Sex Addicts. I really enjoyed this interview, and I know you will too, and we'll be back after we talk to Stephanie and Patrick. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast. This is a first today. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. You know, we've interviewed pioneers before, even husband and wife teams. We have never interviewed a father or daughter, multi-generational team that have impacted the field of sex therapy, sex addiction. And I'm talking about no other than Patrick and Stephanie Carnes. So excited to have you guys here. If you've ever listened to the show, the first question is always, how did you get interested in working? So we'll start with you, Pat. How did you get interested in working in the field of sex addiction? Well, I knew that was going to be your first question, and I appreciate very much your belief in the power of story. And I believe in that 
I believe in uh, Damasio's idea of the autobiographical brain. It's how all how the brain really changes is in stories. And I wrestled with this question about and talked with Stephanie about it a couple times about typically I don't answer that question as directly in public as I do with our trainees and people who I know are going to be working in the field. But I'm at a different perch in my life at this point in time in the sense that I'm 77. And there's a lot of things that over my lifetime I found that I was concerned about that really don't matter much anymore. So telling the story, if it helps people, is uh, a valuable thing. And I think the story, it's a simple one, one for a long time about you know, the impact it had on my life and what have you. But I, um, it started as part of our, the, the family I grew up in was a family in which addiction thrived under many forms. And even as a kid, I found that uh, my sexuality was different than other people's sexuality and had been sexually abused as a kid. And uh, that manifested as I grew into adulthood and found that I was struggling with sexual behaviors I didn't want to have and, and ended up getting some getting help for that. But finding that help was really hard. And I had a, a psychiatrist who really encouraged me, and I got my first grant. He says, you, you need to write up what you're learning about. And I've been talking to therapists throughout, at that time, Minneapolis-St. Paul, and so many people were saying that they had run across and had had the thoughts about this. And so I was, was writing about this and came to the conclusion that one, you know, people use the word call, uh, whole idea of uh, that you have a call in life, I'm sure you're familiar with, and the Joseph Campbell notion. And I realized one day a very uh, friend of mine had invited me to a conference at the University of Minnesota, and I heard an Ivy League professor take a, a person who was struggling with their sexuality and say the most demeaning things about them in public to a whole conference, and everyone laughed. And I was deeply disturbed by it and found myself sitting by the Mississippi River, and I was on a park bench and, and crying, and he came and he sat next to me, and he, he put his arm around me, and he says, I want you to know that the path that you are on is not, I want you to see what you're going to be up against. And if people under, really understand what the nature of what you're trying to bring to the public's awareness is going to be a difficult one. And then the, being the very kind man that he was recognized that I needed to come to grips with myself. And I resolved that day that if I did nothing else in my life, I wanted to leave behind a body of work and people who knew what they were doing when people like me walked in their offices. And that has been pretty much my life's call. And as I look at where we are now, we have over 16 countries involved and people we've trained and we have touched a lot of lives. And many thousands of people at any given moment are working on this issue. And the awareness that is happening worldwide about this as a problem. I leave knowing that Stephanie and people she works in ITAP, which is the institute we found, uh, started working on this and the programs that exist across the country, that that, that has happened. Uh, that there are people who, I hear this story from a lot, I had to go to a lot of therapists before I found someone who knew what I really needed. And that's been very gratifying. I know we have a lot to do yet. And um, I love science. And watching the science emerging has been real rewarding to me. And have participated in that as a Fulbright scholar in other ways. And I am feeling that the only thing is, is that sometimes I feel that I get typecast because I'm always connected with the sex addiction issue. But I've written a lot about trauma which certainly was also part of my history, and a book called Betrayal Bond, which is a um, is just second edition, has come back into the bestseller category. And that's been a very rewarding thing and maybe one of the best books I've ever done. But I, I came because, I, th I think to answer your question, is because I saw a need, and it was painful, and I wanted to do something about it. And I, I think it would be dishonest of me to say that it hasn't been if to say that it was easy it wasn't easy 
There are lots of challenges along the way. Yes, and every pioneer that I've interviewed has been brave and has had to face those challenges. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I got to thank you again for sharing a very personal information. It's also my experience that those of us that have a calling, they have a personal connection to it. And even if you don't generally share that story, I really thank you for doing that on the podcast because you are at a point in your life, a generative time where you can look back and reflect and reflect proudly as we're going to do today. But I really appreciate you sharing that very personal connection to your life's work. And the flip to that, people want to know, like growing up in uh, Karin's household stuff, how old were you when you first realized what dad did for a living? I'd love to hear some stories about that. And then how did you know that you were going to take a very similar path as far as devoting your life's work? Well, as you can imagine, Eli, when you know I was growing up, this was a very challenging issue. I watched my dad really struggle with Uh, the recognition around this issue. I remember stories of him coming home from, you know, trying, he he was setting up a program at a new hospital and he was talking to the medical staff about sex addiction for the first time and the whole medical staff got up and walked out on him and just experiences at conferences where he'd get ridiculed and things like that. It's been a, a very difficult journey to be the pioneer, to be one of the first people talking about this. He was the first person on Oprah, on Donahue, and we have stories about all of those things, but it was not an easy path. And for me, I didn't want to go into this arena when I first got into the field. Of course, I had an interest in psychology and given the addiction in our family and the trauma history there. Uh, But I initially went into medical family therapy and I worked on a brain injury unit, a spinal cord injury unit, and I taught at USD for a while as a MFT faculty person. So I really was going down a different path. And Throughout my journey as a young therapist, he would always say, come to this training or come work with me or check out this research project. And he was always making overtures for connection professionally. And over that, we we bonded. It's been a, an incredible joy of my professional career to be working alongside him. And I feel a lot of passion and calling around the work, given that family member. I experienced the, the difficulty firsthand of all of this, and it really impacted my life. And I think we are both really committed to seeing that people get compassionate and effective treatment around this and to reduce the stigma overall. And I think it's really important to both of us. So I think we have a shared calling in that way. And so it's been a terrific journey. I love how you said that because kind of the goal of any MFT is to look for strength and health. And while diagnostic labels can be important as far as how you treat and whatever, but to erase the stigma. And certainly you all have done that. So let's educate maybe some of our our listeners that don't know of your work or younger to the field. I mean, the term sexual addiction did not appear in any diagnostic statistical manual. It was a very controversial, as we said, topic when Patrick introduced this. So let's first orient our listeners. How do we define sexual addiction? Well, I think what a a way to understand it is the way that people who work in genetics have kind of formulated this is that no one in any addiction, no one starts out to be an addict, mostly even as kids, that they are trying to solve a problem, which is to feel better. And so one of the things that happens is that new behaviors that are unusual and become impulsive with them and where the term impulsivity starts to being used in clinically. And then those behaviors become compulsive in the sense that they are become a pattern that a person has a hard time being able to stop, wants to, but does not. Does the yo-yo kind of, I'm going to stop, like dieting and then binging and all of the things that we see in the addictions, food disorders as well as sexual disorders and the other addictions as well. The way that the morphing that occurs right now, we are on the path that compulsive gambling went through in that compulsive gambling first appeared in the ICDM as a a compulsive gambling and then floated into the addictive category and 
in the DSM-5. The reality is that the compulsivity, I think a lot of people can understand that what really makes compulsive behavior different from addictive behavior is the consequences. In other words, that you know that this is harming you or harming others or will bring disaster to your life career whatever, and you keep on doing it anyway, is one of those behavioral markers in addition to the kind of biological markers that we're using now to understand the differences between addictive and compulsive behavior. But basically, I think one of the problems in understanding this is people have labels in their head. And one of the things we've learned is that whenever sex addiction is applied to a single behavior, such as pedophilia or sexual abuse or the Me Too movement, it's really hard for people to get their arms around. They think that's what sex addiction is. Sex addiction has, can be very ordinary behaviors that become very compulsive and, and addictive over time. From the beginning in addiction medicine, uh, starting with Rado's book in 1922, he said one of the ways you know you have a drug addict is when you have compulsives. It's one of the first things that you look for is a, a pattern of behavior. So we have always defined sex addiction from that point of view of taking the what addictionology has talked for a long time, is that there's this compulsive behavior, taking something that can be very natural and, and common, and suddenly it can become a place where it starts to cause real harm. And that's the line that is crossed. The real crisis, I think, is, is that there's sort of a, process of etiology that's occurring and that what happens is kids get exposed to gaming already has quite a literature to it about the addictive quality of gaming and there are books or movies being made about that and gaming inserts in the brain sort of a way of thinking about sex and when they discover sex on the internet and, then, and what we know is that 600 kids every hour get exposed to something new sexually that they didn't know about on, on the internet, 200 of them are going to be affected in a way that they will start the sexual compulsivity and, and many of them becoming addicts. About uh, 85 of that 200 are under the age of 10. If you do the math and what we know is that about 34%, when Fickle Horf did his first survey, he found that about 34% of kids were experiencing this behavior. And I know from my own history that it is possible to be an, an elementary age kid. And what happens is that you get so focused on it and spend so much time doing it that you can't get your schoolwork done and things that you know, most kids are able to do. And so then they go and they do is they have an assessment to psychiatry and they put them on Adderall. And then if today if they're reviewing porn, for example, and on Adderall, it becomes quite a trip. And then they start looking for other drugs uh, that are stimulants and crystal meth and other things that are readily available to them. And then at 18, they have an overdose and they talk about the drug epidemic. But actually, there's a collection of addictions and they have common neural pathways that they work with, dopamine being one of them. And attention deficit disorder is one of the most common things that we found in our research to be a common in what we call dopamine insufficiency. And that what happens is that the thing that changes it all is early trauma. Trauma and toxic experiences can happen later in life. But when the brain sends hormones and enzymes that start to change the DNA structure of the brain so that the reward center starts taking over and we I've seen this as people have started watching what happens with the pornography issues that occur. And the pornography is not isolated. And it's all part of a larger pattern. Mm -hmm. To say that it is one thing or that it's limited to one age, I have people who started as elderly people and got themselves into huge problems. So the fact is you can't classify it it's like any addiction. You cannot classify it by age or specific behavior. But it's when... The behavior becomes problematic. One of the things that is a myth, and I say the thing that Stephanie is a real pioneer in her own way, in really leading the effort in helping the people in sexual science to see this not as the enemy, but what we're trying to do is help people get their sexuality back because they, it's like identity theft. Their sexual theft, sexuality was taken from them and returned that to where they can live a life in which sex is rewarding for them and intimacy is rewarding. 
the question you ask is really has a vast, simple ideology of it. It's, it's, it's now becoming one of the major portals. American Society for Addiction Medicine talks about this. It's one of the major portals by which people enter all the addictions, including looking at it from a neurobiological point of view. Things like the uh, like obesity, for example, and the nicotine issues. And, I mean, you add it up, all the addictions cost our medical system. If you put it all together, we spent $600 million on responding to the COVID thing, and we had 600,000 dead and almost a billion dollars. We spend a billion dollars a year on addictions every year, and we have almost a million people die every year of addiction-precipitated disease. So you have to, what we've learned is people, first of all, have to understand what makes an addiction work, and then you add in the sex part, and it makes the most sense to them. Unfortunately, a lot of our programs don't really teach much about the brain, about how that reward center can be so powerful and altered by toxic stress or or trauma experiences. Part of changing this culture is educating the public, but also educating the therapists that are directly working with these individuals and family systems. But I I find a lot of therapists still feel woefully unprepared and work in an MFT and a clinical social work training program. And you don't necessarily talk about things like this in standard MFT curriculums. I'm wondering, both of you, but to start with you, Stephanie, what do you think are some of the biggest myths that therapists still hold around sexual addiction and its treatment? And because they believe these myths, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that kind of we call the iatrogenic effects of therapy when you try to do good, but un- unintendedly, you know, make mistakes? What are some of the biggest unintended mistakes that we make with these types of client systems? Well, I think one of the biggest myths goes back a little bit to the controversy that you were alluding to before around the diagnosis. I think that a lot of people are afraid that if we have a diagnosis that we're going to over pathologize everyone and anyone that if you are using porn, you're immediately a sex addict, or we, we're going to call everybody a sex addict. It's a legitimate concern that, you know, we want to embrace sex positivity. And I think that people don't understand that part of healing from a sex addiction is to find a healthy, erotic, fun sex life. That's the ultimate goal. And so it's more similar to recovery from an eating disorder. You know, you have to have a healthy relationship with food. You also have to have a healthy relationship with your sexuality. So I think that is, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about what recovery looks like. That in terms of mistakes that people make, I think this is really a specialty area and there are a lot of people that I think are well-meaning therapists that because there is no tra- there was no diagnosis we don't have a lot of training and training programs all over the country most therapists aren't trained on how to work with this and this is a complicated topic you have to differentiate paraphilias and offenders the family therapy is very complicated very you know betrayed partners are devastated traumatized need a lot of support. The disclosure process with partners is very difficult. And so I think sometimes people get in over their heads when they don't have experience or training in this area. So that's one thing that I would encourage people to seek more training if they're going to be treating this population. Okay, this would not surprise my daughter. I'm going to go out a little further on the limb than she does. (laughs) Yeah, that's no surprise. Like I said, you, you, you're at a point in your career where you have earned you can do that. Well, you know, please you know, go out on a limb. Oh, yeah, right. I, mean, I, I have some great stories about Stephanie in this. But in this particular case, one of the things I want to say is this. That one, one in debriefing, and in fact, as we, we developed a thing called pathos, which is very much like the cage in alcoholism. It was a short, a short screener to help differentiate, and it had a really good accuracy, about 80% for both men and women, actually performed better than the cage ever did. But one of the questions that came up that people noted is how many, the, the problem people had in finding help came up as, as sort of a universal phenomenon. And, uh, and I would hear that story oftentimes. And the fact is, the patient sitting in front of you, you're all that 
that patient has got, right? And to affirm that they can get help and helping them find help is a, a really important thing. And I started, I mean, there was no therapist to really go to who was an expert. And, and the reality is that they sometimes, and, and in the early days, and I would say this and to all of our clinicians, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, when SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, had its first conference, what I counted them up, there were 57 therapists who went to get help. That came to that. So a lot of the therapists that I knew that were colleagues of mine uh, that I met in meeting rooms, and they were only a page ahead of some of their patients. And I was in a group that had met on Thursday night, and uh, we didn't, none of us wanted to see our clients, so started a group on Wednesday night, and none of us knew. And so you may be in an area in which there's no help available. That doesn't to say that you can't learn or that you can't help. I think Steph is absolutely right. This is one of the most complex illnesses with so many countervailing kinds of issues to go into it. But I want you to notice that our Canadian friends in Alberta, when they educated the public, put $150 million into doing this, of educating the public about the nature of addictive disease because the average when they were at the, at the pre-tests, the average citizen saw addiction as a moral problem, a lack of character, a lack of ability to control themselves, or they had bad upbringing. There was some of that as well. And when they did the post-test, after they had really thoroughly um, every channel vehicle that they could to broadcast really good information about addiction in general, sex addiction specifically. But all the addictions, there was a list of addictions that they, they asked, what do you think that the, that the province needs help with? And the number one that they picked was sex addiction. The second was cocaine. The third was compulsive which was interesting in terms of, for a lot of reasons. Anyway, the point is, is that here you have, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there who know that they need something, but where do they go? And I think that's one of the things that Stephanie has been really aware of, is the impact and helping therapists reach out to public. And, and what I'm doing right now, I'm saying to, that there may be listeners who know that, in fact, that they maybe need some help, and they're a professional. We see a lot of those, and a lot of them come become experts in terms of really first of all, getting their own recovery underway, and then when they realize that they have a bit of a calling to start working in this field, they can do a lot of good. And all that I'm saying, though, is that, that therapists, too, have this problem. And there's a certain amount of your listeners, probably about 12%, who have been struggling in some kind of way. And then to know that there's help available, I'm just saying to you, don't hesitate to get the help. I, I mean, I can't tell you how much better life can be and how it can turn out differently. We just see that miracle. I mean, these are great points just to reiterate. First of all, that while working with sexual issues, addiction issues is certainly in the scope of practice of our listeners, MFTs that are listening to this. It's not necessarily in the scope of our competence. So first thing you have to do has to look at yourself. So you have to examine how it works with your own sexuality, and then you have to go and get the training if you're going to work with these populations. I couldn't agree with you more. We're going to tell people where to get the training at the end. But another challenge in this work besides you know the miseducation or the myths and the stigmas is how do you set it up in a modality? So let's start with this. I'll give you an example and you can tell me what you think. You have a couple and uh, one partner, say the male, has uh, found out they have a problematic relationship with pornography and it feels like a violation of trust. And then when they do more digging, they find out this is really a deep-seated um, behavior that has really impacted, as you were saying earlier, the consequences, the functioning on the couple, the functioning on the individual. So you're a uh, systemic therapist. And one of the things is when you're setting up treatment, what are your thoughts on the best modality? When someone comes in with a sexual compulsive behavior leading to addiction, what's the best modality? Should you do that individually? Should you do that as a couple? Should you do that in a group? 
I'm curious what your thoughts on the, the staging of work like this. Well, the answer would be yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so. exactly, that's, exactly, that's funny. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> you beat me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we look at cutting edge treatment for addiction as group therapy. There's really, a, they need group. You just look at, you know, working with chemically dependent clients. You would never see them in a 50 minute session once a week and think that they were going to make it. They just can't make it without more support, more connection, people around them. And they learn things from one another that we can never teach them. When when our clients come into our treatment program, they just feel so relieved because they're talking about this stuff for the first time. And it's just like the weight of the world is coming off their shoulders because they're seeing other people that are, you know, have been going through the same thing. But they also need individual guidance because everybody's sexual health plan is unique. Everybody has their own unique aspects of uh, their treatment, different uh, comorbid diagnoses, things like that. So they need individual work, group therapy, and then family therapy is so important the, because if you don't support there's so much typically in, in coupleships when there's a lot of staggered disclosures and recent betrayals, there's so much hurt and uh, dysregulation that it's very destabilizing for both parties. And if you don't get them treatment, both parties treatment, we recommend therapy for the partner as well and group support if possible then it's hard for the addict to make traction. So really, we really look at it more as like a programmatic treatment model and try and be very comprehensive with the approach. The other thing that I would say in response to that is that uh, what really helps, we have patients come in with uh, our medical director asks them to go get brain scans. And one of the things that's been interesting to watch is the progressive knowledge of how the brain is affected. And the folks who have been looking at porn addicts, because they're on the fMRIs, they are the easiest first to start with. And you look at them, and many primarily are European colleagues, really, although there's a couple in America and the U.S. What they started to notice is that the amount of use of pornography would actually affect how the brain functions. And the restructuring of the brain and the brain gets cannibalized, it cannibalizes itself. The reward center starts to alter various structures in the brain, including the ability to make decisions. So the frontal lobes, the gray matter of the brain declines, then what have you. And that process, some of the research has pointed out, started after that if they were using over four hours of porn a week. And then, it, you know, I got patients who that's all they did. They, 30, 40 hours of four in a week. And so what has happened is their brain has changed and you can actually see that. What is important is that, and I think that, I really think that the people who do the genetic piece is very aware of the neurobiological parts of this. And one of the things that you have to realize, this is not something that heals really quickly. In other words, there's been brain damage. It's important because they use the word that addiction really is a medical condition, that this medical condition is like if you were told you have diabetes and you need to use, you need to take medication for that, you would take that medication. And if you are bipolar, bipolar is, we're very clear about how bipolar works and medications that can really help bipolar. And keeping them on their meds is one of the problems with bipolar. Most of you listening to understand that. Well, sex addiction is the same kind of thing. It's a medical condition, and there are things that have to be in place in order for the changes to occur. It's about a two- to five-year process for the brain to change over in a place where the person shifts. And the interesting example that you, you used of talking about that male who was looking at pornography well, we are learning that right now you know, that, it, that we are seeing in our women's program, we are seeing women have that problem dramatically. And some of them are even in more severe shape than the men are. 
And the fact is, is that what's in common is the neurobiological. The people who did the research in Canada that I mentioned earlier saw such a lack of understanding how this occurs in the brain. They created a 30-hour free brain course. Every professional listening can go to this. It's easy to find. Alberta Family Wellness. Go to the website, Alberta Family Wellness, and you can sign up and you'll get a certificate. 30 hours of intense training in how the brain functions. And it's the beginning of a larger series that they're making it for the medical profession to really understand the biology that is really present here that is clear. And it's for free. There's no cost to this, and it's an excellent program. And I think what our Canadian friends are kind of breaking the path open for us about showing how to really Make a culture aware. The United States is not aware of how many addictions are flourishing right now, including some of the ones they know about. The amount of alcohol consumption right now, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers, and he talks about the myopia of college students and the rise of sexual abuse and on campuses and what have you. That is alcohol precipitated. And myopia is that you don't remember what you did. And neither the victim nor the perpetrator remember what they did. It's a real eye-opener because kids are going to coming to parties not to get drunk. They come to the party drunk to get even more drunk. And the liquor industry at this point in time used to call July as the month, the best month of the year for the for the liquor industry. And now the joke is every month is July. Every liquor store is flourishing. And so what we need to understand is one of the things COVID did is it added some real catalysts to the flames of addiction, addictive avenues. So we have a serious larger problem. And what worked in Alberta was to teach people in general about what the nature of addiction is and that it, it affects kids. And you can have 13, 14, 15-year-old kids. This was even, even in the late 60s and early 70s. They were documented. They made distinctions about different types of alcoholism, and they documented how 13, 14-year-old on start is what they called a primary alcoholic. That For a long time, we've been able to point to younger people. So when I was putting a cabin on lake in northern Minnesota, and I went to put a boat in, and the DNR was there. The woman asked me what I did, and I said, I'm a psychologist. And she said, what kind? And I said, well, I work with addictions. What kind of addiction? And I said, sex addicts. She says, oh, you mean pedophiles? I said, no, you're a seven-year-old. You're a pastor. You're a physician. In other words, it's throughout the culture. It's in many different forms. Sex is just but one of them. But the interesting thing is they occur together. They come in bundles. It's seldom do you do just one. That is the other problem many of the clinicians have to face is that what we call addiction interaction. These addictions actually work together in a metabolic way and they have more power in combination than they do individually. And most clinicians don't get that. Most physicians don't. That's why the website for the American Society of Addiction Medicine is so good, because it lays out how this neural circuitry actually works and how things work together and why it is one of the most serious problems that we're facing today in mental health and that we're talking about something as a medical condition. So well said. You know, I'm also thinking of the times we're living in a global pandemic and both teenagers and adults are, are isolated. And when you get isolated, you go to these repetitive behaviors. So I think even now more than ever, like when I'm working with a teenager, if they're in a in a rut, they've either been gaming too much or watching too much porn. And part of it is these behaviors do cluster together. I couldn't, I think you're giving a very important context and neurobiological frame, but I think even our clinicians out there see these problems coexisting as, as a cluster of behaviors. You know, it's interesting. Pat's career has been all about working with the identified patient, the sex addict. Your career, Stephanie, is working with the partner. It's a, a beautiful complementarity between you all. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what you have learned in your work about supporting family members and spouses of people with sexual addiction? 
Well, I think over the last 15 years, we've become a lot more aware in the field of how devastating this is for partners. Some of the research shows that after a discovery, 72% of partners have severe functional impairment, like can't get through the day, working is difficult, they can't concentrate and have trauma symptoms. And I think that that was under-recognized for many years. And there's really been a whole field that's blossomed around supporting partners with betrayal trauma. And a different for with addiction and infidelity, they're, they're both devastating in different ways. With infidelity, you have obviously the emotional component of, you know, you cared about another person. And that's a very difficult thing for partners to get their heads wrapped around. With addiction, it's often the amount of deception, the acuity of the behaviors, the escalation of the behaviors. And there's just so much. And so they're a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarities with working with whether it's porn addiction, sex addiction, infidelity, and doing couples work. And I think that a lot of people that have become certified as partner trauma therapists are offering groups to partners, and we've gotten a lot better on the couples therapy process and couples healing and just, you know, what needs to happen to get couples through that. A lot of our traditional couples therapy models don't work with addiction and infidelity very well. We've really had to come up with our own model to help people get through this time period so that we can use some of the other models, you know, and get them to a deeper place where couples feel safe to be vulnerable and, um, you know, are able to look at their family of origin issues and things like that. But when they initially come in, they're in a complete state of crisis and they can't do any of that work. We really have had to come up with our own unique process to get couples through this. But it's wonderful to see, you know, the message that I always give couples is that recovery is possible. I always tell our addicts in our treatment programs, recovering addicts can make great partners. You're learning the skills now that you need to become a great partner. You're learning how to be completely honest and vulnerable and empathetic and things like that as part of your recovery journey. And so it's incredible to see the transformations that can happen. I do this aspect of our training processes, train on the work with the couples, and it's just wonderful to see, to be able to keep the families together and to, you know, see people get transformed. We wouldn't do this work as relational healers if we didn't believe people could recover even from serious issues and addiction like this. So you were kind of speaking to it. What do you think recovery looks like both an individual level and a couple or family level with people struggling with sexual addiction? Well, a cautionary tale here I wanted to add to what Stephanie was uh, talking about was just that one of the risks is sometimes we can create our own little islands. And the fact is, is that Working with this issue, the therapists that are seeing the partner and the therapist that's seeing the addict or the team, that is, they need to be talking. Uh, in German and Niskern's book talked about how in systems therapy, seeing somebody about family issues alone without talking uh, is uh, sometimes makes things worse. And that's certainly true of this particular illness is that, that if you have therapists who are on different pages and they don't talk it through, it can create real problems. So it's something I just would add to the mix. If it, it, I think that's one of the answers to the question you were asking, Eli, about what recovery looks like. To me, what recovery is really about is, first of all, you have to move it where, first of all, they are, uh, the behavior is arrested so that the brain can get its traction to do therapy. And then what you have to start doing is the emotional regulation work. It's kind of the way the steps work at, in all the 12-step programs. You have this fourth and fifth step. What really is their teaching is basically emotional regulation. That's what therapists need to, to teach. What happened in their history? What happened in the trauma? What are the skills that they need? How do they, how do they regulate? How do they detach enough to see that something is a very bad idea? 
that kind of stuff. And then they, they learn all these new skills and they have to translate that into how they change their life. And so as an older guy, I've had several encounters where death was near. And what I realized as I walked out of that is you start to realize that you're putting time into things that are unimportant. And I think that's what re recovery does is it shifts the focus to things that are important. And what we teach, and we have a, a book called Recovery Zone, and basically there's a zone, an optimum zone that you can live in, and that the core to that zone is learning about what resilience is. And resilience relies on a number of habits that you live every day. There are certain resilient skills, master skills we call them, that you have in terms of uh, living your life in terms of what is important. And then finally, there's just plain ordinary daily strategies that nobody's ever taken time to teach the patient along the way that can really make their life different. Ultimately, the bottom line is that it's how you show up. In other words, how you meet people, how you are with people. I was flying in front to Atlanta with a guy, it was a movie producer, and he was going to film a sequence of car crashes, and I like cars, so I was interested in talking to him. And after about five minutes, I knew that he was in recovery, and I said, you've got to be in recovery. He says, yeah, I've been in IA for five years. Most of us in Hollywood are in some 12-step program. And he says, AA has been great for me. He says, but I got a problem. And he leaned over, and he says, would you know anything about sex addiction? And, and I said, well, I know a little. I've been in the program since 77. And he said, I've got three sponsees that they're not listening to their sex addiction people. They're not listening to their sponsors. They're doing things that are dangerous. And as an AA sponsor, I don't want to be part of this. So I fired them. And he said, these three guys have got enough sexual energy to light up a third world country. He says, I don't know what to do. Does that ever happen? And I said, that is sadly what is hard about sex addiction is, is that it, it, we are wired to be sexual. We are wired to eat. These what, the two hardest things to work with are, in fact, these things that can bring, you know, really very serious issues in their life. So I think recovery really is living in a, a very different life, one in which things matter and in which you show up for people in a way. And he said, how did you know I was in recovery? And I said, because how you talked to me. You were immediately vulnerable. You were available. It's the language you use, what have you. I just said to myself, this is a guy who's learned how to be a real human being and available. And that's the kind of thing that makes you know that there's something different about this guy. He's worked through some of the hard things. And that's what I look for, is that they're willing to do the things that they know are the next right thing to do. Oh, I think what he just said was beautifully stated. The vulnerability, being in your integrity, that's what it takes to be successful in a relationship. And like I said earlier, just the, those kind of skills that people learn in, in recoveries is what is needed in couples work. When I'm talking to pioneers and model developers, I ask the legacy question, uh, how do you want to be remembered? Since I have this unique opportunity of a father and daughter that are personally and professionally connected, I want you to tell your uh, loved one what of all the things that they've done in their career, what is the most significant thing that you will take away from your time together and your professional and personal collaboration? Well, I think that what I admire most about my dad is that he took something that was very challenging, very painful, and turned it around for himself and figured out how to make it something beautiful. I think that's in incredible. I I'm, I hope that in, in my life I'm able to do the same thing, and I and I do. I have had uh, a lot of my own personal journey with this as well. And have used a lot of my own learnings uh, in my work ar around couples therapy and in my writing. So I really value that. And in terms of legacy, sometimes as, as you, you've been listening to my dad talk for the last hour, you know, he's 
always thinking very theoretically and he's read a gazillion books. He's read everything out there. <laughs> he loves to read and he's always operating at 60,000 feet. And I feel like, you know, part of my hope is that I'm a, in my work is to help nail this strategy, this expert system that he's come up with down. And now we've got a full curriculum that is published and to translate that in a way that therapists can really use it. And again, to ultimately to meet that mission of compassionate treatment for everybody. And I think we've created a beautiful community of therapists that are on the same road with us. And I feel like that's been incredibly worthwhile. Same question, Patrick. Uh, I got lots of comments about that. Um, so one of the things that I have noticed in colleagues of mine who also have had similar careers that and their children have joined them is that wide ranging what Goldman talked about was the wandering mind characteristics of people who create something that's why oftentimes the people who really make a difference in science come from a different field it's a it's just part of the nature of those people who pioneer but they have kids who are really a very top-down mind orderly let's get this done then that done then what have you and it's almost like what's happened and I watched the birth order is that somehow this has emerged that that the kid that picks up to walk with the parent seems to have that ability to nail things down organizationally and what have you. And I've been very gifted with with a daughter who is has great talent that way, but also is an inspiring speaker in her own right and, and what have you. And gets me. That I that's one of the things I, I, I first of all say I'm very admire her and, uh, and appreciate what she has done and it's a pattern that I have noticed is that uh, uh, the one in behinds are the ones that make the legacy actually uh, work. Second thing I would say that at this age sometimes I think that the most important things you do really is people will never find out about. And I've had that experience a number of times, and I've seen that in Stephanie's life, too. You have to look at why you're in this. And if it's to get the accolades and what have you, you're, you're, you're attaching a string to your work. That there, there may be times that you're not going to be affirmed for what you did. But if you do, did something that was right to do, that, and, and you can go to rest, knowing that that's true is perhaps one of the real challenges and gifts of being in a career like this is it's not always the public self uh, so sometimes the private and the unknown or the unpublished or the unwitnessed that is important so i feel very very grateful uh, uh, stephanie's been a great partner i have a story about her though I wanted to tell before it's all over this interview. <laughs> I, have, I have lots of Stephanie stories, and, and I love to have her in my audience. W one was is that one very early she had just went through her first training in sex addiction, and in there we spend a day on financial disorders, because the gambling and the hoarding and the whole emerging field of financial disorders. She hadn't heard this before, so we're driving to the airport. And she said to me, you know, Dad, you just can't go around and keep inventing diseases. And it just <laughs> cracked me up because, you know, now the, the woman is one of the probably best knowledgeable speakers about some of the financial disorders and how they fit with the other addictive issues. But the, the point is, is that I think that very fun. I have had, uh, she has upended me many times. And, and the one time I got a chance to upend her was we, I was 75, we did a celebration and it was uh, Star Wars Day in the United States. And I got her at that time, 13 year old and 11 year old to dress up as Jedi Knights and we filmed them. And they would comment on our 
on our career in front of the audience periodically. They'd appear in a PowerPoint and make a comment. It was so fun. And it was the best line of the whole thing is, I feel this force, this disruption in the force. Oh, it's Stephanie. She's wondering, where the hell are you going with all this? And it just cracked everybody up. And I loved doing that. I just loved doing that to her. It's one of the most fun things that we did family-wise, and the audience loved it. I can't thank you both enough. I mean, I think people will get a sense of both the fondness and admiration and great respect you have for each other personally and professionally. And really, it is a nice complimentary in your styles and your passion. And both of you have your personal stories that you shared that brought you to this work and continues even at 70 plus years old, uh, Pat, to keep you vital. And another thing after listening, it's like all of these model developers that I've talked to, I mean, they're doing the work, not for the recognition, not for the things you say, because it makes a difference and they still enjoy, whether it be reading or staying active and doing the work clinically. So I can't thank you both enough. Now, people will listen to this and there's many Patrick and Stephanie Carnes books out there and other things. So I should now tell our listeners, if you if this is in your scope of practice, but not, as I said, in your scope of competence yet, and you want to learn more, you've already told us about some great resources, Pat, that Alberta Family Wellness uh, for free. Now let's talk about if I want to get advanced training, learn more about this model that we've so nicely kind of teased, but didn't really in this hour uh, get to cover the specifics of where can people go to get more information and further training? Um, They can go to itap.com, which is the International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals. So it's iitap.com. There's information about both our certified sex addiction therapists, certified multiple addiction therapists, certified partner trauma therapists, programs so they can get more information there. And Stephanie mentioned your latest book. Oh yes, I just have a new book for couples out called Courageous Love. It's a guide for couples conquering betrayal and it's for infidelity, sex addiction, porn addiction, any kind of sexual betrayal. Eli back with you bring to a close another successful installment our first father-daughter interview ever of the AMFT podcast. I can't thank Patrick and Stephanie enough. You know, you ever listen to people and you just learn so much? I feel like both of them, especially listening to Patrick, he could go on all day and share his knowledge. And Stephanie, as we mentioned, I'd like to again, let our listeners know about Courageous Love, a couple's guide to conquering betrayal, which came out last year. Courageous Love provides a step-by-step guide for repairing your relationship, whether that be something damaged by infidelity, pornography, or some type of compulsive and addictive behavior or sexual issue like we've talked about today. Stephanie teaches in the book couples how to respond to one another with compassion and empathy, how to hold on to hope in their relationship. It's a must read for therapists and to recommend for couples struggling with the aftermath of betrayal. As always, We listen to you, the listener, to inform what we bring to you on the podcast. Best way to get a hold of me, Eli at NorthstarCounselingCenter.com. That's the email. You can also go to EliCaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M. Follow the conversation on Twitter. The AMFT is at the AMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. We'd love to hear from you. You can pick up all the back installments of the podcast wherever you find your favorite podcast. I'm partial to Apple Podcasts, but you can go to Spotify, Google, Stitcher, where you can find three seasons full of both movers and shakers and leaders in systemic therapy. We have one more installment left in 2021. And then we'll head into our fourth season of 2022. It's always fun to be with you. Until next time, stay safe, stay systemic.